Thank you, darling. When God is near. Daniel chapter 8. Let's read a couple of verses. Daniel chapter 8 in your Bibles. And you'll probably be able to guess who our famous faithful is tonight. Daniel chapter 8, verse 26 says, And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Father in heaven, please help us as we once again look into your word and these amazing characters in the scripture, these men and these women who are so faithful. And Father, may we recognize that you have placed them in your word so that we will learn not just more about them, but mostly more about you. And I pray that we will tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 27, look at it again, would you? It says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Everybody here tonight is well aware that this amazing book contains glorious and wonderful prophecies we've all taught and all learned through the years. In fact, this chapter alone tells of the events following the Babylonian Empire, including Medo-Persia, King Darius, King Cyrus, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the coming of the Antichrist. All of that world history and prophecy is contained in this one little chapter. So the, once again, the Daniel as a book is unparalleled in its mystery, in its prophecy and revelation. But obviously what is also true about this amazing book is that it's extremely powerful and helpful for what it says about a man. And therefore, what it says about life. What it says about not only the far and distant future, both for Daniel and in some cases for us, but for the very near and current present, including the very challenging and difficult days that all of us have, have to face from time to time. If you were to take away all of the prophecies out of this book, I mean, if you were to take out all of the visions contained in the book of Daniel and only had left the historical and biographical material, it would still be an amazing powerful and enlightening and encouraging book of scripture. And the reason is that the book of Daniel is about a man, as we said. It's about a young man. In fact, young people, it's about a teenager. A young teenager taken far away from his home. It's about a middle-aged man. And ultimately and eventually, it's about an aged man who all of his life was faithful to God and was faithful to God in a faithless environment. So that right smack in the middle of what today is known as Iraq, there was a young man who lived an amazing and a miraculous life. And far as I'm concerned, he takes away all of the excuses. Well, Pastor, you don't know what it's like to be a teenager today. I know what it would be like to be a teenager in Daniel's day as an exile among pagans. He takes away all of the excuses. He was in exile in a very strange land who learned and understood what it means truly to trust in God. We have all at times seen on the evening news footage of refugees. I don't know that there's anything that I ever see on the news that burdens my heart and breaks my heart more than when I see refugees fleeing for their lives knowing full well that they will probably never return home. And there are little children and little babies crying, and mothers in particular, doing all they can to, to comfort them and to save them from misery. And so they're leaving these lands and these countries that no longer want them. And you've seen the hollowed, fearful, and the bewildered faces of those who are wandering and finally perhaps ending up in refugee camps. Those are the faces of exiles. These are the faces of people who have been forced from their homes. Their homes. You have a home. You wouldn't want anybody to come take your home, much less force you out of it, never to see it again. You've worked hard for it, right? They were forced from their homes into places that will never truly be home. The faces of a people who have watched 
their houses and their villages and their fields destroyed. Right? It still happens all over the world. It's happening this week in various places. All over the world, these, before their very eyes, they see everything gone. They are refugees and exiles. If you look at those faces on the news sometime, then you will see the faces of these people in the book of Daniel. I'll remind you that Daniel was a teenager, a young man, whose home and homeland was destroyed by brutal forces. The brutal Babylonian Empire. Daniel was a young man who was uprooted from his home and his nation. And young people taken as a slave. Taken as a slave thousands of miles away to a pagan nation not his own. And yet, it is as this young man, as this stranger in a strange land, that Daniel learns and teaches us what it truly means to be faithful to God and teaches us the faithfulness of God himself. He says in verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Now, you mean to tell me now, we fast forward it obviously from his teenage days, we may return to that if we have time tonight. But you mean to tell me that the great prophet, in a chapter again, as we just noted, that's filled with glory and revelation and vision from God, that the chapter ends with this man fatigued and sick? That he's at home in bed? He's in bed. That he needs a Z-Pack or a doctor or something? Yes. When it says in verse 27, I, Daniel, fainted, it's an old English definition. In its old, it means he was exhausted. He was absolutely worn out. And then either because of that exhaustion or on top of it and in addition to it, he was also sick. And it says he stayed sick for days, a number of days. And that's not all. In verse 7, you'll notice that Daniel confesses to a condition that we all have at times. You notice there, he says, I was afraid. Now, note this carefully. This is God's man in Babylon. Here, God's prophet. He's tired. He's afraid. He's sick. According to the last line of verse 27, he's also perplexed. And you know what? If you really want to consider the weight of this very obvious point, don't forget that all of these conditions were the result of being God's man in God's will. Where God wanted him to be. In other words, beloved, the vision itself is the position that God placed him in. That was precisely what led him to being so weary and becoming sick and perplexed and afraid. I'll remind you of what Paul said about Epaphroditus. He said, quote, that for the sake of the ministry, he was nigh unto death. Really? That's not fair. So, Pastor, what are you saying? All I'm saying is God does not ignore the truth that life includes burdens. That sometimes being right smack in the middle of God's will, even as God's prophet, includes burdens. I'm saying that these characters who are on television concocting a gospel that guarantees wealth and health and prosperity for everyone is not a message you find in the Bible. How many biographies have we looked at already? The Bible teaches, is, what it teaches is sometimes God's people get sick. And sometimes you're afraid and worn out, weary, fainted, he said, and perplexed. And sometimes when you endure all of those things, you can be a hero in the Word of God. Like Elijah last Wednesday night. It happened to Daniel. It happened to Moses. It happened to Paul. It happened to David. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are are the afflictions of the, of, the prosper, of the righteous. Proverbs 24, 16 says, A just man falleth seven times. Why? Why does a just man have to fall once? A just man falleth seven times, but riseth up again. He falleth? Yep. Did you notice verse 27? Daniel says, Afterward I rose up. Well, guess what? You can't rise up if you haven't been down first. And Daniel was down. 
This was God's man running on empty because life has burdens. Even if, like Daniel, you are situate, situated right in the middle of God's perfect will. In John chapter 9, the disciples came to Jesus one day and said, Master, who did sin that this man was born blind? Himself or his parents? You know, they, they had the same assumption that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which was totally carnal. And Jesus said, how about neither? How about I want to use this blindness for the glory of God? Now, folks, look, it just so happens that because of the fallen, imperfect world and sometimes because of sin, always in a cursed, imperfect world, there's going to be some burdens and, and disappointments, including the huge disappointment that Daniel felt when he realized what the, what the vision meant for him. You know, when I was a boy... My dad worked near Kennedy Space Center, Patrick Air Force Base. And you know the big, big news next to the Apollo program, which was obviously the biggest news, was one day there was going to be this opening of this place that we heard about called Walt Disney World, 1971. And I was in the fourth grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade when they were building it. And for years, Disney World was being constructed. And that last year, you know, because we had heard about it and that, we were only we only lived maybe an hour and forty five minutes from it, and so it was like a lifetime for a fifth grader. And then it opened its doors to the public, and by far my favorite part was something called Tomorrowland. They had a ride there then called Flight to the Moon. They had another one called If You Had Wings. I'm not sure if any of those are still there. I doubt it. Three years later, they added Space Mountain. Can you imagine? There was no no Space Mountain at Tomorrowland when I went. My days, boys and girls, when I went there was. A and then they added the carousel of progress. And you would sit there and see all these futuristic things, and they presented the future as some sort of sci-fi utopia. It was nirvana, where you eat food, you know, magically grown through hydroponics and all of this stuff, and everyone's scooting around America in these hovercrafts, and they're going on family vacations to Yellowstone in, in, in 90 minutes from Orlando, blah, blah, blah. And I remember then that the magical year, they've changed it, of course, but at that time, in 1971, the magical year for all of this Futurama was the year 2000. That seemed like a long, that seemed like impossible, right? The year 2000, like the Jetsons or something in our mind. And so by 2000, all these advances in science and medicine technology were going to be here and there would be no sickness and no disease and no car accidents and no mechanical problems. I mean, they literally presented, Epcot was the experimental prototype city of tomorrow, wasn't even built yet. All of this was like going to be nirvana. It was his vision. Positivism. And I have to tell you, as a fifth grader, it was magical. But by the year 2000, I'm disappointed. <laughs> there are no hoverboards no flying cars, no hovercrafts made by Chevrolet. There's a Chevrolet Volt. We have that. You know, it doesn't have big enough to hold a gun rack, so it's worthless. But, you know, obviously I'm not a fifth grader in Tomorrowland anymore, but all of that was just a big carrot that was a big disappointment and a big lie. What do you do with your disappointments? And, you know, since the fifth grade, there's been sicknesses and weariness and fears and and so many other burdens in life. And what do you do about it? Here's what he says. Look at it, verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. And afterward, I was bitter. Afterward, I rose up. And did the king's business. Now, folks, when Daniel says, I rose up and did the king's business, what he basically means is, afterward, after I was sick and so forth, I went back to work. I was exhausted. I was afraid. I was sick. I was perplexed. But I rose up afterward, and I went back to work. You know, this is something that, that this generation, your generation, sorry, needs to hear and see. They think they graduate from college and they should make $150,000 a year because they have a degree in art. Sorry. Somebody lied to you. 
You get sick, you're laid out, you get better, then get up and go back to work. It sounds old school, but it's, it's very old. It's Daniel and Babylon. Now, don't forget when he says, afterward, I, and I did the king's business. Now, don't forget who the king was. The king's described in chapter 8 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel. Belshazzar literally means Baal is king. This is the same pagan king who saw the handwriting on the wall, who was weighed in the balances and found wanting. He was an ambitious, immoral idolater who made sport out of of blaspheming the God of Israel. Daniel's God. And so this is Daniel the slave. That's who he worked for. And you complain about your boss, Jeffrey. (laughs) You see, the reason... Why Daniel's life defines faithfulness is that even in the midst of sickness and disappointments and weariness and trials, it says he rose up and he did the king's business. Sometimes a believer is down, as Paul taught. He's never down and out. It was Paul who said in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are troubled on every side but not uh, distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted, not forsaken, cast down, not destroyed. And the very next verse he said, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. In other words, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. So get back up. The righteous man falleth, but rises back up. There are burdens and trials. There are fears and there are sicknesses and there are questions and there are perplexities. And every believer endures temptations that are common to man. But as it was with this man, our hero tonight, Daniel, we can still rise up and faithfully do what we're supposed to do. Do the king's business. We can still pray and we can still read the scriptures and be in church as you are. God bless you for that. And visit and study and be good fathers and grandfathers and good mothers and grandmothers, and we can be good young people, and not just good, but we can be great and exceptional even in the will of God. So that in fact, what Daniel shows us, beloved, and what the Bible teaches is that adversity and disappointments can make us even better as his representatives in Babylon where we are. Remember the old Biosphere 2 experiment? The scientists sequestered themselves for a couple years they made this artificial environment, and in this sort of self-sustained bubble, this, this artificial community, they created these little mini-environments. And there was this desert and a rainforest and, and all this. I, don't know. I, I'm, I love science, and I believe in science, but as far as I'm concerned, that was, that was kind of dumb. And the one thing they couldn't quite simulate, if you've read all about this, and many of you have, was wind. And they didn't think that was a big deal, but over time, the effects of a windless environment became very apparent. One example, a bunch of acacia trees were weakened. And and even though they had plenty of sunlight and plenty of water and fertilizer, they bent over and they would snap. And it reminded them that without the stress of wind to strengthen the wood, that the trunks grew weak and they couldn't even hold up their own weight. And, you know, every time Daniel weathered a storm, and he went from this storm to another storm, you'll read through the Bible, and Daniel, you'll find he just got stronger and stronger. And that is a promise, by the way, that's given to every single child of God. How do we remember our heroic people in the Bible? Sometimes all you have to do is finish the sentence. You say, Daniel and the, Daniel and the lounge chair. David and glamour shots. Moses and, uh, uh, I mean, Noah and the uh, uh, Alaskan cruise. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't Moses 40 years in the Waldorf Astoria, right? Isn't it amazing? We, we almost always remember the heroes in the faith by their difficulties, by their trials. It's Daniel in the lion's den. It's by their difficulties and precisely because God strengthened them and sustained them and upheld them through all of it. By the way, 
Did you notice one of the truths that helped Daniel be so diligent in his disappointments? Chapter 8, look at verse 13. He said, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? Look at verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So a saint and a certain saint and Gabriel and another man. In other words, look, it's true that Daniel is far away in Babylon, away from his home. And it's true tonight that you are far away from your eternal heavenly citizenship, physically speaking. Daniel's in exile, thousands of miles, thousand miles away from Jerusalem and the people of God. But it's also true that Daniel's not alone. God is showing Daniel he's not alone, he's not abandoned, he's not forgotten, so that he realizes that as a believer in the one true God, he is literally part of an eternal family. And so am I. And so are you. Way off in Babylon. What does he hear? He says, I heard a saint. I heard, number two, a certain saint. Number three, I heard the angel Gabriel. And then he says, I heard a man's voice, which was, I think, no doubt, the voice of Christ himself. And it all included and concerned Daniel. All of these things and these people and these voices concerned Daniel. And all of this he saw and he heard where? Not in the temple at Jerusalem. All of this he saw and he heard and he experienced, not in the holy city, not in the sanctuary of God a thousand miles away, but in the banks of the river Ulai, a river in Persia that surrounded the city of Shushan. In fact, look at verse 2, chapter 8. I saw in a vision and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Sushan in the palace. That would be exactly like saying I was at Moscow in Stalin's compound. I was at Berlin in Hitler's Reichstag. I was at Patmos in Caesar's prison. I was at Ohio in Cleveland. Amen. Same thing. In other words, it's a reminder of where he was. And where was he, Pastor? He was away. He was alone. He was alienated. But then again, he, he wasn't. And the reason he wasn't alone, beloved, is the same reason that you're not alone. It's a lie of Satan. If you ever get somewhere in your place and you sit there and you start to sulk and you say, nobody knows, nobody cares, nobody understands, I'm all alone. That is, that is a lie of Satan. As we saw last week with Elijah. We belong to a family. And I love this family. Look at chapter 9 and verse 20. Chapter 9, verse 20 says, And whiles I was speaking. See, we're going to speak southern when we get to heaven, apparently. And whiles I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whiles I was speaking in a prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening Oblation. Do you know why that's important? Are you telling me that after all of these years and after all of these th thousand miles that Daniel in this foreign land is still observing the evening oblation? That's the evening offering in Moses' law. Yeah. They changed his clothes, his diet, and his name, but it didn't stick. They, at the very beginning of Daniel, they tried to call him Belteshazzar. At the end of Daniel, he's still called Daniel, 90 years later. He didn't embrace that. It didn't define him. In fact, let me tell you, let me share with you Daniel's real secret. We all love the stories, and I love them on Daniel in the lion's den, and we could have spent all of tonight just on that amazing story. It's amazing. Lions are horrifying. And he was thrown in the lion's den, if you look at the text. There's a spe specific one that they put him in. They were going to eat him. And we could spend the whole, we could have done that. His bravery and not defiling himself with the king's meat. But I want to tell you what I believe is the secret to Daniel. Daniel. The Bible says he had an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. You know people like this and I know people like this. 
This is the reason he had it. This is his whole secret. Look at chapter 6. I'm going to show it to you. This verse and a few others, you'll see it. Chapter 6, verse 10 says, Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. Now, what writing? This is the writing that's going to put him to death. He's in trouble. You know, we just had a Supreme Court case about a baker. But they weren't going to kill the baker. They weren't going to put him in jail. They weren't going to throw him in a den of lions. They weren't going to throw him in a fiery furnace. But this was going to be something, that, a law that was going to take away his life. All right, read it. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks. There it is. He gave thanks before his God. Look at this line. As he did aforetime. Now wait a minute. The law is no more praying, except it's to Nebuchadnezzar. He got on his knees and he prayed and he gave thanks. For what? Everything's against him now. But he gave thanks as he did aforetime, before. Well, he certainly gave thanks for, look at verse 1 of the chapter. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes. Darius, not... not uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So he gave thanks aforetime, just in the time of blessing. And you know what? We all enjoy times of blessing. He, there was a time when Daniel was prosperous and productive and promoted, and there he gave thanks. Exactly as he had done, by the way, in chapter 2. Turn back to there. Again, this is to me, for, as far as I'm concerned, the great secret of his excellent spirit. Chapter 2, verse 19. Then was a secret revealed in a Daniel night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Look at verse 23. I thank thee. And praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hath given me wisdom and might. I thank you and I praise you. Here he is, beloved, Daniel the Grateful. Daniel, when God blessed him, gave credit where credit was due. Do I? You know why he did that? Because one of the great lines in chapter 2 and verse 28 is where Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. And the Bible teaches us that that's part of gratitude, recognizing that there's a God in heaven, that every good and perfect, it comes down. There is a God in heaven. Do we praise God for his blessings? I mean this. I mean when the bills are paid, when your health is good, when you have a job, when the food is plenty, when the sun is shining, when you're not in chronic pain, do you look up and say, there is a God in heaven? And you give thanks. Daniel gave thanks in times of blessings. He, he also, as we just read a moment ago, when he, he knows he's about to die, perhaps, he gives thanks in times of burden. But when you read through the book of Daniel, you'll find that he was also grateful in just the everyday, day-to-day, -day mundane living in a faraway land. Think about it this way, look. Daniel was a man who lived to be 90 or 91 years of age, right? He was taken captive as a teenager. And from the time that he's a teenager until he's 91 years of age, there are really only three or four major incidents in his life in the Bible. There are three or four incidents that cover three or four weeks, weeks out of 91 years. So, if Daniel's not every day being delivered from a lion, and he's not, or reading every day somebody's handwriting on the wall, then what's he doing the rest of his 90 plus years in Babylon? Well, folks, he is in the same place that most of us spend the bulk of our days on earth. Every day, 
regular, what we would consider mundane days. Abraham's another one. You know, if you look at Abraham's long life in the Bible, there's only a few things out of his 90, many, many plus years that are in the Word of God all the rest of his days. He's just a man living and traveling. What is he doing all those boring, tedious days, this man, Daniel? The same thing as aforetime. Three times a day, every day, he's on his knees. He's facing Jerusalem because that's his real home. And he's giving thanks. Every day, three times a day, he has a reason to be grateful. Turn to chapter 12. I'm going to show you how this thing closes because it's remarkable to me. Daniel chapter 12. Look at verse 9. And he said, well, verse 8, And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And the Lord said, he said, Go thy way, Daniel. He talks some more, and then verse 13 he says, the last verse says, But go thou thy way till the end be. Now, folks, look. Daniel was commanded to, quote, go his way. After he had received all of these amazing, glorious revelations and visions, I hope you can appreciate and understand how challenging, how difficult, and maybe disappointing this command must have been. Because to go thy way simply means, Daniel, go back to this pagan land of exile. Go thy way meant to Daniel, go back and put aside all these glorious visions of the last days and of God's kingdom because they're not for you, Daniel. He tells them in verse 4, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. And now you go back to work. These things about God's kingdom and Christ's return and just you start living again for me in the barren land of Persia. Wow. So that as an old man who had been in exile since a teenager, it had to be a tough thing to experience something like the Mount of Transfiguration and the glory of what he saw and suddenly go back to the trenches of ancient Babylon and Medo-Persia. A major setback. But you know, the very last verse, the very last statement in the book of Daniel is wonderful, but go thou way, thy way. Verse 13. Till the end be... For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. In other words, look, here's the, here's, here's the promise. It's the last words of Daniel. Yeah, he had to go his way. He had to go back. But in the end, in the final analysis, what sickness? There shall be no more tears near sorrow. In the final analysis, what weariness, what temptation, and what fear? As I speak tonight, and you sit out there tonight, Daniel is not in Babylon anymore. He is standing, though, and he is resting in his lot. Some of you here tonight, as a Christian, the burdens, maybe, and the disappointments in life have left you weary and maybe spiritually down. Remember this, you're not alone in Babylon. This spiritual warfare is real. Gabriel and the angels and the Lord Jesus... If God could roll back and would roll back the veil, you would see. You're not alone. And you can rise up when God gives you strength, and you can do the king's business. Because one day, you will rest, and you will stand in your lot. And forever you will glorify God, and, and glorify him in part, and say, as we know in Revelation, thou art worthy to receive honor and glory and power. And God's people said, Amen. Father, we are grateful for this man, your servant, who purposed in his heart as a young man that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. And from that point, you caused him to be a faithful servant. And thank you, Lord, that we can see that he was grateful three times a day, every day, 
in blessing and in burden and in everyday days. And may we do the same. May we recognize also, Father, that you gave him amazing visions and prophecies and truths that we can see your hand working in the world more so than he could even see because we have the benefit, Father, of looking back and seeing those prophecies fulfilled and knowing that you will finish them all. Bless us, Lord, to be powerful testimonies of your grace for there are lost people all around us who need the same gospel. We'll praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.